Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this De Morgan talk, Defining Pre-Raphaelite Poetics. It's my delight and honour to welcome our speakers this evening. I'm honestly so grateful that you've uh, been able to join us to tell us about the new publication, Defining Pre-Raphaelite Poetics. Uh, and my guests are Heather Burzant Witcher, who's an assistant professor at Auburn University, Montgomery, USA. Her research focuses on 19th century poetics, collaboration and sociability, as well as archival theory and digital humanities and Amy Carmen Hoosby, who's an assistant teaching professor at Florida International University, USA, where she teaches courses in 19th century British literature. Her research focuses, focuses on 19th century poetics, gender and sexuality, race and empire, and the history of science. So two very well qualified women who I'm delighted to welcome this evening to talk about their publication. It's over to you, thank you. Good afternoon and evening, everyone. I am Dr. Heather Bozant Witcher, and it's my pleasure and honor with my co editor, Dr. Amy Carmen Hughesby, to introduce you all to defining pre Raphaelite poetics. And before we begin, we both want to extend our thanks to the De Morgan Collection for the invitation to speak today. Additionally, just as a technological forewarning, as we switch back and forth between the two of us speaking, there will be a small pause as we hand off sharing of the slides. Defining pre-Raphaelite poetics emphasizes the plurality of pre-Raphaelite poetics. That is not to say that pre-Raphaelitism is all things, and as a consequence, to impute to the category less integrity. Instead, we place their forms of self-expression under this rubric of plurality to designate heterogeneity, cultural borrowing, innovation, and evolution as the foundation for all pre-Raphaelite forms of making. Moreover, we position pre-Raphaelite poetics broadly in the sense of poesis or acts of making. Poesis, the originary term from whence poetry takes its name, initially intended all art forms involved in creative making. Our collection therefore returns to these origins in our endeavor to understand pre-Raphaelite poetics. In so doing, the definitional capacity of our collection extends from poetry to music to visual arts, as well as to the making of the pre-Raphaelites as a society themselves. In short, we, ex we explore the pre-Raphaelites diverse forms of making, social, aesthetic, and gendered. Such forms emerge as the recognizable content, imagery, and aesthetics of pre-Raphaelitism. Broadly, these include homosocial networks, genealogies of inspiration and collaboration, multimedial and intertextual borrowing, homage and reference, reaching backward and forward historically, drawing on the past and becoming inspiration for the future, 
political commentary and activism, complex gender dynamics, which include sensual love and the idealization of women and women creators writing against precisely those ideals, nature and representations of inner experience, and the use of legend, Arthurian, Celtic, and Norse. Each of our chapters examines how the pre-Raphaelites and pre-Raphaelitism take up and explore modes of making and remaking identity, relationality, moral transformations, and even time and space. Ultimately, we argue that the plurality or the interlacing of, vari uh, or interlacing of variety of artistic forms of pre-Raphaelite poetics is its consummate defining quality. To accommodate this comprehensive understanding of poetics, defining pre-Raphaelite poetics takes up the question of pre-Raphaelite form. In Victorian literature and culture, um, which provided keywords for the Victorian field, Stephen Arada and Herbert Tucker assert the prominence of form and formalism as a burgeoning field of literary study. As Arada and Tucker note, the concept of form is capacious and should be celebrated for its openness. In our collection, we celebrate form's extensive range through our emphasis on literary pre-Raphaelitism as a conscious act of making through poetic experimentation and social networking. Extending Carolyn Levine's concept of affordances to link literature and politics, many of our contributors use form as an organizing principle, one which connects the literary musical and visual art to social and political life. Form thereby offers a method of defining pre-Raphaelite poetics, not as a what, but a how, as a verb rather than as a noun. In other words, form reorients the definition of pre-Raphaelitism away from components or lists of required elements and toward an awareness of method, process and action. We conceptualize form broadly to encompass poetry's inception from artistic conventions and in recognition of how form shapes lived experience. Literary pre-Raphaelitism especially uses form to unsettle artistic representations of reality. Our contributors pay close attention to this generic destabilization and their re-examination of well-known pre-Raphaelite poets. We emphasize literary pre-Raphaelitism as open-minded in terms of gender, sexuality, and political influence, collaboratively experimental in technique and structure, and intermedial, using aesthetics as a way of engaging with moral and social concerns. In this way, we apprehend pre-Raphaelitism as engaging with and responding to social and political life. Broadening beyond the traditional cast of pre-Raphaelite poets, our contributors are attuned to less acknowledged pre-Raphaelite voices. The chapters of our collection consider both the influences and departures from the recognized pre-Raphaelite school to draw attention to innovation in terms of prosody and style, metrical patterning, rhythm and rhyme, all of which contribute to a sense of pre-Raphaelite formal density as a precursor to modernist poetics. Our contributors thus offer a broader range of pre-Raphaelite literary scholarship, provoking innovative discussions into the poetic form, gender dynamics, political engagement, and networked communities of pre-Raphaelitism. That said, we recognize the hubris of attempting to codify a definition of an artistic movement that so many scholars agree is marked by, quote, protean shifts in membership, parameters, and objectives. As Dinah Rowe rightly observes, such a task is a tricky business indeed. In truth, there has been no critical consensus until now on what constitutes pre-Raphaelitism due in large part to the diversity of subject matter and shifting membership. Michaela, Michaela Giebelhausen and Tim Berenger note the lack of cohesion in the history of pre-Raphaelitism from 1848 to 1919. Pre-Raphaelitism was not a monolithic entity with a tightly focused aesthetic agenda. It was different things at different times in its long history that spanned more than a half a century from the founding of the Brotherhood in 1848 to the death of William Michael Rossetti, founder member, diarist of the Brotherhood, art critic, indefatigable chronicler, 
and keeper of the Rosetti legacy in 1919. By turning to poetics as forms of making, our volume offers a starting point for future directions in literary pre-Raphaelitism. In doing so, we continue the trend of looking outward beyond an exclusive group of primarily male members to consider a wider membership, historical trajectory, and sphere of literary influence than heretofore acknowledged. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood that formed in 1848 famously included Dante Gabriel Rossetti, William Holman Hunt, John Everett Millay, James Collinson, Frederick George Stevens, Thomas Woolner, and William Michael Rossetti. Of this first wave of Pre-Raphaelitism, all but William Michael Rossetti were painters. The Royal Academy's insistence on conventional techniques for composition and subject matter exerted a force on these first pre-Raphaelites as they came together and sought ways to reject and resist such traditions. It is fair to say that these young men were doing what all groups do who believe they are revolutionary, rejecting tradition, breaking apart antiquated forms, and reassembling the pieces into something new. With youthful arrogance, Dinah Rowe explains, these painters, the eldest of whom was only 24, rejected Academy-approved work as the sloshy legacy of Sir Sloshua himself, better known as the first RA president, Sir Joshua Reynolds. Emboldened by the hubris of youth, the initial PRB members at once rejected and reached back to tradition. Historically, scholarship has marked this first wave of pre-Raphaelitism as apolitical, while attributing political awareness to the second wave in 1856. Emerging again as a collaboration of painters and poets, Edward Byrne Jones and William Morris produced the Oxford and Cambridge Magazine, a periodical substantially influenced by the germ and analyzed in detail by Florence Booz in our volume. Members of this second wave of pre-Raphaelitism include Arthur Hughes, Valentin Princep, and Algernon Charles Swinburne. Swinburne's poetry, for instance, was decidedly political in its subject matter, openly addressing sexuality and queer desire. One need only consider the sadomasochism of an actoria with its references to quivering and pain made perfect, a physicality that imbues its rhythms, or Swinburne's flogging poems, to recognize that Swinburne demands readers consider the power structures of intimacy, and in the case of Arthur's flogging, of childhood. However, less attention has been paid to the sexuality and diversity inherent in the earlier pre-Raphaelites, as John Holmes's chapter on intersexuality in this collection posits. Alongside these examples of art and poetry written by men, we can add also pre-Raphaelite women, such as Christina Rossetti and, less often realized, Lizzie Siddall, both of whom had clear political investments. Taking these claims together, two central contributions of our study emerge from the language of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and this attribution to political awareness to the second wave. First, we argue it is imperative to turn attention to reconsiderations of gendered language, recalling of course that gender deconstruction is a political act. By forms of making our volume intends poesis writ large, as any activity that manifests in reality what had not previously existed in that form. When conceiving of defining pre-Raphaelite poetics, we realized that while the focus remains on defining the hallmarks of literary pre-Raphaelitism, we were invested in rethinking the gendered language of the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood to provide a more realistic understanding of the diversity among the movement's, movement's membership. Consequently, central to this volume is a resistance to the gendered language of brotherhood or sisterhood. Rather than segregating these groups in a gender binary, we endeavor to explore a spectrum of gender identities alongside and in relation with one another. Although much scholarship examines only the pre-Raphaelite brothers or pre-Raphaelite sisters, often to the point of detrimental exclusivity, we embrace pre-Raphaelitism for its collectivity, inclusiveness, and fluidity. Scholars have recognized for some time now that the appellation of the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood unnecessarily narrows the movement and defines it as male. The pre-Raphaelites, however, were inclusive and open-minded, using their poetry and art to explore diversity, often to the shock of their contemporaries. 
Although the movement began as a group of male painters, multiplicity was central to the Pre-Raphaelites' creed, and their school quickly expanded beyond this foundation to include women and those who identified as what we would consider today to be queer. Many of our chapters, including those by Holmes, Hannah Comer, Robert Wilkes, and Serena Trowbridge, widened conceptions of literary pre-Raphaelitism by disclosing networks of artistic and literary influence. These chapters foreground individuals that have not traditionally been associated with the movement, such as D.H. Lawrence, Ezra Pound, and H.D., or upon whose literary work little critical attention has been placed, including, again, Lizzie Siddall, F.G. Stevens, John Lucas Tupper, and Georgiana Byrne-Jones. Such efforts to grapple with new concepts and understanding underpins pre-Raphaelite poetics, an investment in plurality and collaboration that expanded to include other forms of making such as music and visual arts. Second, we contend that the pre-Raphaelite's plurality and openness to new forms of making was itself fundamentally a political act. In many ways, the poet artists of the first wave were very similar to the early 20th century avant-garde in their goals, which were both artistic and decidedly political. As Ezra Pound wrote in his 81st canto, quote, to break the pentameter, that was the first heave. But then in the second canto's wry hat tip to Robert Browning, he says, quote, hang it all, Robert Browning, there can be but one Sordello. The PRB created a new from old components. It is no coincidence that Algernon Charles Swinburne, a second wave pre-Raphaelite, would also tap Browning's Sordello in Songs Before Sunrise, 1871, Swinburne's most politically minded collection. While Browning's jaw-swinging rhythms and broken use of syntax appealed to Pound's imagism, for Swinburne, these same formal elements suggested the spasmodic poetry of the late 1840s and early 1850s. Even as the modernists dismissed the Pre-Raphaelites, quote, as a sort of childish thing, which a writer must put away upon achieving literary maturity, end quote, they shared a fundamental investment, the decidedly political value of making new forms from old. This move by Pound and Swinburne was politically powerful because it actuated the positive potential of making new holes and types. That each poet plumbed the earlier work for components that spoke to their personal poetics is unremarkable. For that is how intertextuality and inspiration have always worked. Rather, the poet's respective insistence on making new is where their ways of making diverge, one in the direction of spasmodism and pre-Raphaelitism the other in the direction of avant-garde methods such as imagism. In doing so, each poet and poetic school located themselves in an implicitly political act as the foundation of their creative endeavor. For, Caroline, for as Caroline Levine has observed, wholeness can be inimical for its capacity to exclude and restrict, crafting social totalities rather than celebrating difference and diversity. While unified wholes can be pernicious on political grounds, like the sloshy legacy of tradition rejected by first wave pre-Raphaelites, new forms of making, of disruption and reformation are a productive alternative that involves not the destruction of form, but its multiplication. Put differently, the pre-Raphaelites initial impulse to rebel against Royal Academy conventions was in fact an effective strategy for curtailing the power of harmfully totalizing and unifying categories by introducing more holes or more categories. Yet the kind of new forms that Swinburne and Pound located by disassembling Browning's work and reassembling it through different methods of making disrupted the controlling power of other bounded shapes. The encounters themselves providing opportunities for new and emancipatory social formations. In contrast to so many, including Dante Gabriel Rossetti himself, who have set aside the pre-Raphaelites as prattle, lax, foolish, and obsolete, we argue that pre-Raphaelite ways of making, their poesis, shouldered substantial political weight. Consequently, no matter the content of their work or accusations of being, quote, glibly imitative, the pre-Raphaelites were engaged in a political project of which even some of their own members were unaware a claim that we explore further in our discussion of the gendered politics of Ford Maddox Brown's work and Lizzie Siddall's poetry. We use Brown's painting work as a wedge into our discussion of the gender politics 
inherent in expanded pre-Raphaelite networks and collaborations. When Ford Maddox Brown completed the socialist painting in 1865, he published a pamphlet with his written description of the image's political work. Far from pre-Raphaelitism's 19th century reputation, provided by Robert Browning's 1871 critical attack of the movement as, quote, fleshly, self-indulgent school, popularizing the notion of art for art's sake, Brown's painting, commissioned by Thomas Plint, was always a political statement. Plint, a religious evangelical and stockbroker, had purchased several pre-Raphaelite paintings, but he died before work was completed. What possible reason could Brown have for painting this collision of social classes for Plint? These laboring men, bereft homeless children, wealthy riders on horseback and lovely ladies, all of whom were watched over by avatars for Thomas Carlyle and Frederick Maurice, the famous essayist, polemicist, and anti-democrat, and the founder of Christian socialism, respectively, were meant to hang in the home of a man who had based his life upon capitalism and Christian ideology. One might imagine that Plint anticipated receiving an image that laudus, lauded the Protestant work ethic. Instead, Brown represented negotiations of space, economics, gender, and belief, all of, all of which Victorian England had to contend. What he made for Plint was not a celebration of Protestant values, but a condemnation of the assumptions that frugality and hard work benefit all equally. Certainly one might stop here with an inquiry into this painting's political work. However, Brown has not only thrown together social classes, but genders. Whether viewed as a pyramid or an oval, the grouping of characters holds at its center laboring men. There are five possibly more visible women, all of whom occupy the periphery of the image, one on horseback accompanying her father or husband or brother, two beneath parasols stepping daintily around the muck in the street, perhaps one small older sister in her tatty red dress who sadly does not rest at the base of the image, but labors to wrangle her three siblings and their mongrel dog, and what might be a traveler beneath the tree to the right, opening what appears to be the wrappings on her meager lunch of bread and cheese. Centering the traditional laborers, the reflexive subjects of work, as Brown does, might invite a reading constituting the work of the title, as ultimately the work of men, while the work of women remains difficult to locate, unless it be in the juvenile sister minding her siblings or in the ambiguous flower seller. However, knowledge of the separation of spheres and expectations that women's work was decidedly domestic and constrained within such spaces provides an explanation for Brown's choice. The grouping of children at the base of the image tells a story of maternal absence and of the types of women's work that occur within private spaces rather than in the middle of a public street, the labor of bearing children, four in this image, and the daily necessity of housework, such as mending and washing clothes for those same children. Brown does not erase women's labor from this image simply by omitting explicit depictions. Rather, he weighs it against that of men's labor by way of the spatial orientations of the image. As Frederick Maurice and the young Navi create the horizontal axis of this image, so the homeless adolescent girl and her reflection in the wealthy young woman on horseback form its vertical. Unlike Maurice and the Navi, however, it is impossible to draw a 90 degree vertical from the young girl to the woman on horseback because this figure and her siblings are slightly off center. Indeed, Brown had room to place them further to the left as what occupies that space in the image is but a pulley and a laborer's boot. Therefore, it was a choice to place them off kilter. They're not quite on plumb. So while the political work of this image is evident and an effort on Brown's part to depict some sort of gender relations, our claim does not suggest that Brown advocates for women's equality here. The types of labor suggested by the orphan children are still those of childbirth and housekeeping. Their left of center placement suggests that the kinds of physical and emotional work done by women are not quite up to snuff or workmanlike, failing to double check the geometry and amount to what they should. Other types of women's work hinted at in the image are equally sexist. They include care work, the woman hand, handing out lunch under the tree, companionship, the young woman on horseback, beautifying one's surroundings, the two upper-class ladies with parasols and engaging in the light physical labor of selling flowers. <laughs>
gender inequality finds its way into this image as a collection of acute angles, elisions, and social norms. Thus, while Brown crafted his painting to reveal to Plint the economic inequities of Victorian society, he inadvertently disclosed his own gender biases and sexism in the process. By focusing on Brown's painting, we emphasize the importance and necessity of turning to the Pre-Raphaelites for their puissant political aptitude. Critics of the Pre-Raphaelites in the 19th century and today foreground and condemn their innovation. However, we recognize in that innovation an explicit political project sidelined by critical emphasis on Pre-Raphaelite aesthetics. On the one hand, Pre-Raphaelite art is experiencing a renewed popularity with a number of recent international exhibitions proposing to solidify the thematic and formal elements of the visual arts. Pre-Raphaelite poetry, on the other hand, has not yet shaken off the aforementioned 19th century reputation of fleshliness. Such a reputation has polarized study surrounding the Pre-Raphaelites, marking them as disengaged or disinterested members of Victorian society who care only for etherealized themes of sexuality, love and creative inspiration. Put differently, pre-Raphaelitism's reputation as strictly aesthetic and sensual has enabled a view of their poetry and prose as non-critical or unworthy of serious scholarly attention. This critical divide, however, has marginalized a fairly influential po political move movement. For instance, Brown's political investments emerge as an emphasis on socioeconomic inequalities that literally marginalize women in the space of his painting, sequestering them to the edges both visually and in the ideology of separate spheres. Brown's women only contribute to work by tending children, looking lovely and being companionable. Brown's apparent blindness to his own sexist attitudes are countered in appealing ways by turning to the work of Siddle. As pre-Raphaelite poets, uh, when, um, oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, as Serena Trowbridge does in the seventh chapter of our collection, we too consider Lizzie Siddall's poetry in context, positioning her as a pre-Raphaelite poet and a woman writing in the 19th century. In our chapter, we close read Siddall in order to establish a foundation for understanding pre-Raphaelite poetics as political and especially as taking up gender politics. Siddall's poetry stands in contrast to the reading of Brown's decidedly androcentric political statement and work. Critical consideration of Siddall's poetics has been hampered by William Michael Rossetti's assessment of the, quote, wail of pang and pathos that runs throughout many of her poems. Yet Constant, Constance Hassett and Serena Trowbridge have argued that while the dead or dying woman, the tendency towards melancholy, and the negative outlook towards romantic relationships are prominent in Siddall's work, those attributes are not uncommon for the period. Rather than being set back by William Michael Rossetti's off-putting remarks, reading Siddall's work within the context of pre-Raphaelitism asks us to reconsider the ways in which a woman's voice establishes a lyric intensity that offers a unique way of seeing through cl close attention and introspection paralleling a reversal of priorities in order to make a gendered and political statement through its attention to women's thoughts or that which is often perceived as trivial. Initially published and heavily edited in William Michael Rossetti's Some Remin uh, Reminiscences in 1906, Lord May I Come appears at first glance to be a simplistic poem structured with double and repeated rhymes and framed by repetitive questions. Often in aestheticized and predominantly masculine poetics, a dying woman is depicted in idealized terms while remaining traditionally silent. Here, however, Siddall uses direct language to offer not only a voice to the woman, but a poetics grounded in patterns of introspection and observation. In doing so, priority is placed not on the bodily or material world, but on the internal self, depicted through close attention to landscape elements. Traditionally, the poem has been read biographically, 
driven by Rossetti's commentary on the shakiness of the manuscript hand, which he reads as an indication of the influence of laudanum, and Sadal's grief after the birth of her stillborn daughter. However, beyond this context, Sadal's poetics reveal a sense of pre-Raphaelite primitiveness and the poem's keen observation of the natural world that depicts an inward turn toward the speaker's psychological state, thereby valuing feminine interiority over the bodily exterior. Through new forms of making, her poetics engages in a radical politics consonant with the Victorian era's tension between faith and doubt, reimagining traditional modes of religious conviction as rooted not in the divine, but in the known natural environment as a means of psychological assurance. If the first two stanzas are marked by repetitive religious questioning, Lord, have I long to go? Lord, may I come? And relatively straightforward rhyme scheme, the final stanza transitions to double rhymes punctuated by a plea for remembrance. O oh Lord, remember me, before devolving into a series of questions regarding the unknown land. In this transitional poetics, the speaker seeks reassurance. How is it in the unknown land? Do the dead wander hand in hand? Do we clasp dead hands and quiver with an endless joy forever? The unknown is articulated by Siddal through natural observation, a likening of the mysterious world to the known world through a comparison first of physical activity and emotion before a return to the natural environment. Are there lakes of endless song to rest our tired eyes upon? Do tall white angels gaze and wend along the bank banks where lilies bend? Like her fellow pre-Raphaelites, Siddal relies upon synesthesia to convey her inquiries, mixing sight with song and movement with stasis. And so doing the poetic voice amalgamates external observation with introspection to generate a voice permeated by doubt while desiring reassurance as illustrated in the, in the poem's final lines. Lord, we know not how this may be, Good Lord, we put our faith in thee. Oh God, remember me. Such a term, turn might initially seem consistent with normative understandings of 19th century women's devotional poetry, doubt and reassurance provided by faith in God. But here, Sadal reverses gender politics by suggesting that reassurance is found not only in religion, but in the certainty provided by natural observation guided by the resolve to endure grief through close attention to the surrounding landscape as evocative of the world to come. She offers, in other words, a new form of seeing, a new form of making, guided by her quest for internal truth, a new form reliant on female introspection. Chapters in defining pre-Raphaelite poetics likewise assert the political investments of pre-Raphaelitism. In so doing, they divulge what Dinah Rowe in our afterward identifies as six paths for further work and critical inquiry. Number one, proto-modernism. Hannah Comer's identification of the intersections between Dante Gabriel Rossetti's and D.H. Lawrence's versions of the Persephone myth alongside Heather McAlpin's discussion of the use of the emblem in Christina Rossetti's and Ezra Pound's works, gestures toward larger trends in recent scholarship that interrogate the Victorian modernist divide. Two, periodical contexts. Pre-Raphaelite journalism is the focus of Florence Booz's chapter on the history of the Oxford and Cambridge magazine and its significance in shaping pre-Raphaelite poetry. While Robert Wilkes' recovery of F.G. Stevens can inspire future directions for both archival and periodical appearances of pre-Raphaelite poems. Three, music and oral culture. We identify sound as a primary hallmark that distinguishes literary pre-Raphaelitism and Mary Arsenault's chapter on the history of setting pre-Raphaelite poetry to music alongside Elizabeth Helsinger's focus on Swinburne's musical rhythms and Wagnerian influences demonstrate that future work is needed to define 
and broaden the relationship between sound, rhythm, and poetry. Four, global context and race. Admittedly, more work is needed to understand the global impact of pre-Raphaelitism and its awareness of diversity. We acknowledge in this collection that the relationship between pre-Raphaelite literature, empire, and colonialism may be the area's most neglected topic. Despite some work appearing in 2005's Worldwide Pre-Raphaelitism and in Eleonora Sasso's more recent, The Pre-Raphaelites and Orientalism 2018. There are glimpses of this work in Arsenault's discussions of musical settings, Helsinger's analysis of the relationships between Swinburne, Baudelaire, and Wagner, and Booz's discussion of pre-Raphaelite responses to the Crimean War. However, future scholarship must address the transatlantic context and European roots of literary pre-Raphaelitism. Five, gender. As we've discussed earlier, our volume calls for further exploration of gender identities and addresses the ways in which pre-Raphaelitism complicates and resists gender binaries. In particular, John Holmes's chapter on intersexuality in early pre-Raphaelite work published in The Germ brilliantly underscores what he terms, quote, a spectrum of gender identities in the works of the first wave of literary pre-Raphaelitism. Six, form. In an attempt to redress the claims of pre-Raphaelite poetry as non-critical, many of our contributors turn close attention to poetic form and style. Serena Trowbridge's chapter on Sadal's poetics foregrounds the complexity of Sadal's poetic practice and illuminates critical engagement with a poet that has for so long remained in the shadows. Similarly, Helsinger's and McAlpin's astute analysis of Swinburne and Christina Rossetti demonstrate the hybridity and innovative qualities of literary pre-Raphaelitism that are only discovered through critical attention and close readings of form. In generating and compiling this volume of essays, we noted the obstacles of studying literary pre-Raphaelitism as a coherent movement and transformed these challenges into opportunities. The very aspects of plurality that defy cohesion are the aspects that need to be understood as the unique literary contribution to pre-Raphaelite scholarship. And they can pave the way forward for future directions and discussions. Thank you. We'll now open up the remaining time for Q&A, which will be moderated by Sarah Hardy. Thank you so much for uh, an absolutely wonderful talk. And thank you, you know, for taking what is quite clearly such an enormous subject that you devoted the last couple of minutes to there to what more needs to be done um, <laughs> into that very, very concise and, and beautifully delivered talk is uh, no mean feat. So thank you so much for, uh, for doing that so eloquently for us. And we've got hand clapping symbols coming up all over the screen <laughs> there as well, which I hope you can see as well. Um, yeah, as Amy said, we're, I'm very happy to take questions if anybody wants to uh, type those in the chat box and then I can ask them to to the speakers and we can have a discussion about some of the themes, ideas, um, uh, individual uh, pieces that are written about in, um, in this collaborative book. If anybody's got anything. Well, whilst you have a think, I'll turn to the notes I was making whilst you were speaking. Um, and something that I wanted, it's not so much a, a question that I had, but more of a comment on um, a, a remark that you made about turning your attention to women's thoughts. And I just thought that was so powerful, a way to start viewing and reviewing um, the, the poetry of the pre-Raphaelites is to turn to women's thoughts. So not necessarily uh, just looking at the poetry of uh, the women in, associated with the movement, but to look at other poetry and how it addresses or how it depicts the thoughts and feelings women are supposed to have. Um, and I think aligning that against how we see kind of maybe a, a more practical imagining or depiction of that in Ford Maddox Brown's work was a really clever uh, sort of way to, to set those two things off against each other. But um, maybe that's something I just wanted you to, if you could expand on that, you know, this idea about the attention in poetry being placed on women's thoughts. So in particular, um, when I'm analyzing um, Lizzie Sadal's poems, um, that's one of the 
the key aspect that stands out to me um, is that what we are getting um, is not simply, you know, this is the way that um, the prescribed right way that women are supposed to act. Um, but I think that one of the contributions of literary periaphyletism is a focus on introspection. Um, and John Holmes in his chapter also um, discusses that as um, what he terms of poetics of inquiry. Um, and so that sort of delving into um, what, uh, in the poetry and the same kinds of things that we see in uh, pre-Raphaelite paintings, right? That close attention to detail, um, that close attention um, to observations uh, in the natural world. Um, but in the poetry, we really see um, more of an interior landscape, um, which is coming out of right Victorian conventions of say the dramatic monologue, um, but pre-Raphaelite poetry um, takes that a little bit further to explore, um, especially um, the thoughts of those individuals who are often on the periphery um, or marginalized in other ways. And I would follow up with that um, in the chapter, which is the longer version of the the conversation that we just portrayed for you between um, the image work and. Uh, Lizzie Siddall's poem. We also close read a poem by Christina Rossetti called A Triad. It's very often included in uh, anthologies, but it's not very often taught. It's sort of, you know, one of those quick little poems it's easy to overlook. It's a sonnet um, in which Rossetti portrays three different types of women. She's basically categorizing types of women. And um, I think it's an interesting thinking poem in the sense of, um, you know, a poem that works through a problem, which is um, how does society quantify and categorize women? And what do we do with that? Like, how is it manifested um, in society? And she makes use of that kind of counting of women and um, categorization of women in the, in the very poetics of her poem. Uh, she does it formally um, by sort of using the sound and the meter to conjure avatars of each of the different characters. So I think it's really important that we begin to understand um, that the poems weren't just light and pretty, but they were thinking spaces. They were laboratories for working through social problems and especially social problems that were unique to women. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Like you say, so much to, to come from it. That sort of comes back to one of my other comments I've written down, which is um, whether you think the form and style can be more critical than the subject itself, uh, particularly when we're speaking to the politics that these women had and their political views. Absolutely. Um, I think that um, one of the areas of neglect have been an attention to form and style because often um, pre-Raphaelite form um, is kind of um, uh, reshaping the content of the poetry. Um, and so um, like Isabel Armstrong discusses one of the key aspects of Victorian poetry being a double poem. Um, and the Pre-Raphaelites do that to some extent as well. Um, but because we haven't paid critical attention to um, the way in which the Pre-Raphaelites are using experimental forms, uh, shaping, um, you know, aspects of the past um, and bringing it into the 19th century, we miss that sort of critical approach to um, politics, uh, especially, um, and gender dynamics. I agree. Again, um, just the, the um, sonnet that I mentioned, a triad, absolutely does this. Rossetti combines all three kinds of sonnet. Uh, Petrarchan, Shakespearean, Spencerian in the one sonnet. And she does that in order to think, to have her form of her poem perform the typology that's going on with the women. She's, and she modifies the different sonnet structures slightly too. It's as though she's saying, um, you can no more categorize more my poetry than you can categorize the women that I'm talking about. So intelligent, isn't it? Fantastic. So smart. Yeah. yeah, very, very genius. And we don't, I mean, just the lay reader doesn't very often look at the forms of the poetry. We reread re the words and enjoy them. Um, but there's a whole other level that makes the poems move and act and do things that warrants more attention. 
Thank you. Uh, so a question from um, one of the audience is considering Dante Gabriel Rossetti's, it's important in this one to differentiate your Rossetti. So uh, considering Dante Gabriel Rossetti went above and beyond to help establish Lady Siddall's art career, was it simply Victorian gender norms why the pre-Raphaelite painters did not seek women to join them in their creative ideals? Um, I'm not certain if it's you know, simply gender norms, um, because as we know also that um, Dante Gabriel Rossetti um, encouraged uh, Siddall's poetry as well. That's what uh, I was thinking of too, yeah. And uh, in the case of um, Georgiana Byrne Jones, right? Um, she's also encouraged by William Morris and um, obviously her husband, Edward Byrne Jones as well. Um, so we do have um, these instances, again, of collaboration, but because, um, you know, in the 19th century, they were women, it, it wasn't published, right? Um, and only now, if you pay attention to, as Florence Booz does, the periodical contexts, the manuscripts, um, can you really see uh, the innovation uh, and experimentation and originality of uh, feminine women, uh, pre-Raphaelites, right? Um, and we're seeing the same thing happening in the art world too, where we're drawing closer attention to um, female pre-Raphaelite artists. Um, and I also think that perhaps um, a lot of it has to do um, with publication, right? Um, so initially the only way that we encountered Lizzie Siddall was through William Michael Rossetti. Um, and we always have to be careful through uh, when we get that kind of editorializing lens um, that this and, and those those published poems were a disaster. Like if you look at Serena Trowbridge's um, recent volume that transcribes Siddall, Siddall's poetry, um, you get a really clear understanding of um, the demolishing that he did um, and um, cutting away um, that you really miss in um, in the female poetics. And that's just an area that we're continuing to explore. Peri periodical context is another key area. Um, and Robert Wilkes also addresses the kind of manuscript poetry in his uh, chapter on F.G. Stevens as well. So it's not just that we're recovering female voices, we're also recovering um, lesser known pre-Raphaelites. Um, and I think that that's something to, to keep in mind. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so another question about uh, Ford Levitz Brown. Did any of the artists comment on the time about their thinking behind their works? So I think that's probably a bit more about the paintings. Well, um, well Brown did inter with, yeah. Brown it's absolutely interesting to expand did. that to poetry as well, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, it's totally fine. Yeah, Brown absolutely did. I mentioned in the talk that he published a pamphlet where he gave his, his reading of the, of the painting. Um, about that though, I would say that like writers, things get into artistic work that maybe aren't always intentional. Um, the way I explain it to my students is sort of like um, when you train for a football match, for example, you may train out all your all your moves that you're gonna make when you get on the field, but once you're in the game, you your moves change from moment to moment. This happens with writers too. Anybody that writes knows you sit down with a game plan maybe um, and an outline, but you never quite end up where you begin. And that's certainly the case with creative writing as well. And so, um, and with painting, um, I've been learning how to paint over the last six months. And so you begin with a vision in mind, but something else gets in there. Um, and I suspect that's the case in any painting. So even if they leave a really detailed, this is what I meant for that to mean, there's always room to read into uh, a painting, you know, what we're seeing there um, to some extent. So that's what I'll say about Brown's work. Did you have other ideas of other paintings that had left pamphlets, Heather, or anything like that? Um, not that I'm aware of, though. Um, I don't know if F.G. Stevens did. Robert is here, so he might be able to Yeah, add. good thought. Maybe Robert could pitch in. Well, I did think about there, you know, it was it was common for the pre-Raphaelites to embed writing on an image too. So that was its own form of commentary about the about the image. So Rosetti, Dante Rosetti especially did this. Um, 
and there is a good body of scholarship about that um, transmedial work of the visual and the written together in the same spaces. So that's something else that might be worth considering. Um, Robert says in chat, yes, Stevens wrote a pamphlet in 1860 to accompany Hunt's The Finding of the Savior in the Temple. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Robert is one of our contributors um, and added a really, really important never before published uh, manuscript to our volume um, about uh, based on Arthurian legends. So it's very exciting. So there's another answer. A lovely segue into another question that we've had, Amy, well done, um, which is right. in your... <laughs> <laughs> in your slides, you mentioned that different mythologies, such as Celtic and Arthurian, were used um, in pre-Raphaelite forms, aka music and poetry. Did some of these pre-Raphaelites reshape these mythologies to explore different things like gender identities and politics? Lovely question, thank you. Yeah. Um, Amy, do you want to take that one? Well, I would say yes. <laughs> my, my initial reaction is just yes. I, I teach a class on uh, Victorian uh, medievalism. So um, yes, th that, that's part of what I was just mentioning with the way that um, our own ideologies and, and subconscious ways of feeling about things creep into art. So I think that that's you know, very, very common in all art. But when I've taught um, images from the Pre-Raphaelites that are based in Arthurian and Celtic myth, um, they are shaped by those artists' um, opinions and ideologies from the Victorian era. Um, so I think that's just a, a yes, first of all. Um, I'm not sure, Heather, would you expand on that? I would add also just in our, in our volume, um, we have Florence Booz's chapter um, that discusses in detail um, how uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti and um, William Morris um, elaborate, reshape, and then revise um, Arthurian legend and myth. Um, and then Robert in his chapter discusses F.G. Stevens' uh, work on the Arthur Arthurian fragments. Um, and so, um, you know, our collection is definitely interested in the ways that um, pre-Raphaelite poetry is reshaping these mythologies. Um, but Robert might be able to talk a little bit more about his chapter and how, um, you know, F.G. Stevens uh, is shaping um, the Arthurian myth based on the Arthurian fragments that he discovered. Um, yeah, one thing I thought of while you were talking, thank you for reminding me, we actually have a bounty of, of uh, material in our book about Arthurian uh, legend and how it gets into the pre-Raphaelites work. But I specifically thought about that section um, that talks about the pre-Raphaelites talking about themselves as a round table and as knights, um, which, you know, the round table was a male space. It was a androcentric space meant for men, not meant for women. Um, but it also, you know, links them back to these traditions of chivalry and um, of standing up against wrong and has all these other affiliations to it. So I found that very interesting. It's something I hadn't known before, but apparently they regularly talked about themselves as a round table. So. Unsurprising when you do hear that though. Mm -hmm. um, I invited Robert to unmute himself and he has done. I think you should be able to turn your video on Great. as well, Robert, if you would Please like to. Please join uh... us, Robert. <laughs> Jump in the party, Robert. It's good to see you. Sorry, I'm, it's very hot here. I'm in Brazil right now, so it's very hot, hence why I, I'm wearing a vest. <laughs> it's very hot here. Um, but yes, um, uh, Stevens took a great interest in the Arthurian legends, um, as I tried to demonstrate in my chapter. Um, and I think I showed it in my lecture last week um, for the De Morgan Foundation, um, this um, uh, list that he made of Arthurian, original Arthurian uh, uh, manu uh, medieval manuscripts and antiquarian sources as well. Um, so he was clearly doing a lot of research, uh, like original research um, into um, the Arthurian, uh, or the matter of Britain as it's called. Um, and that that into all that that research he did in turn shaped his his poem um, actual almost extracts from, for example, Geoffrey of Monmouth's history of the kings of Britain uh, appear in the poem almost kind of paraphrased and um, the poem that's published in the book. Um, 
And then also to a certain extent, the painting he did at the same time, which is of an, also of an Arthurian subject. Um, so this idea of him being very preoccupied with, um, with the Arthurian myths um, is, is uh, something I wanted to explore in my, in my chapter. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, 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 it wasn't just him, of course, there was a lot, there was a lot of activity like that going on. Um, and, and I think I think maybe there's more to be said about about the, how the Pre-Raphaelites conducted um, almost scholarly research themselves. Sort of uh, whether there were any uh, the others who were interested more in the, for example, Rossetti uh, going to see medieval manuscripts in the British Museum for his work, and and the idea of going not just to an art gallery but doing other forms of. Of, of reading and 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 almost art historical research. Uh, I, I don't know if that's a bit of a far out idea, um, but just it, how and how that those things informed their writing and their um, their, their their paintings as well. I actually um, just pulled up the list from your chapter, Robert. It's actually I, if anybody's got the book, it's on page one twenty four. But it's so interesting because it's. It's actually something that Stevens wrote on the same sheet of paper that he was writing extract from Tennyson's Mort D'Arger. Yeah. And it's like, it's a fascinating list that it's got sort of authorities of, um, authorities relative to King Arthur is what it says. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, quite quite a, actually it's a, a bit of a reading list that my medievalism students would like. <laughs> um, you know, including like this first, it's got Geoffrey of Monmouth Chronicle on there, but it's a really fascinating list. and. Um, has a lovely scan there from from your work. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very for joining us. It's so good to see you. Pleasure to be included and and um, and and to, to hear your talk as well. Thanks so much, other, Robert. Were there other questions, Sarah? Uh, just sort of one more uh, comment um, again about this idea that we can look with hindsight upon these artworks and poems and open those up to new. Um, new readings and to interrogate them in different ways, really, which uh, is, is maybe, you know, unless anybody else does have another question, please do write it. But that I think is quite a, a, a nice ending to it, really, to say, yes, there are all these different lenses that we can absolutely look at different art forms, whether that's the poetry or the paintings through. And actually uh, that sort of speaks to what you were saying in the beginning as well, to look at this idea of form, which I really liked and applying that idea of the, the pre-Raphaelites, I think you said as makers, not only to the art forms that they created, but to the form of social groups that they had. And of course, you know, the, the more critical we are about networks, people themselves and the art that they were making, we start to, end up with uh, an even bigger list than the one you gave in your last slide of the uh, future projects that need to be looked at. All right, well, thank you very much. It's been our pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, just lots of um, lots of lovely thank yous coming in. So I hope you both can see the chat box because they're, they're definitely for you, not for me. Oh, an important question. Where can we purchase the book? Oh. <laughs> Palgrave's website, um, and I could also um, circulate uh, the kind of flyer that we have. Um, we have a discount then, code that's good yes. through March 15th. Yes, there's a discount. Um, I, I believe it's 20% off of the book price, which is exciting. Um, and um, I could send that to Sarah and maybe. Yes, please. And I would say um, for those that are academics here and able to do so, please do reach out to your librarians and consider asking them to order a copy. Um, this, this is enough of a, um, it's the first time since the 80s that a book has been put together that tries to codify what pre-Raphaelitism is. So it will be very useful to students and your colleagues alike. We hope. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just checking that there weren't any final questions. And I think that these are all just um, sort of wonderful words of praise and thanks, which um, I'd like to reiterate on behalf of the Foundation as well for joining us this afternoon, evening, morning, wherever uh, you are in the world and, uh, and for joining us. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you, Robert, for chipping in as well. We'll have a reg regular Friday night slot question time with Robert, I think. It's <laughs> sweet too. It's great. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs>